This tune has uh, several cues, um, and they're all, um, I guess, composed cues, in a way. Some, of, yeah. And um, there's three names. One is long, which is a cue that that will will demonstrate that goes into slow. It's like the first half of it is in tempo, and then it's like a drop in tempo, and it goes back. You know, so that's the long cue. And then there's one called four. That's usually how we get back to the original tempo. It's a shorter version of that composed cue. Then there's out, meaning we're taking the, we're going to do the cue, and then we're going to take the head out and end the song. So other than that, there's a head at the top and a head at the end, composed written section. And then those cues kind of, you know, keep us uh, uh, getting into new little territories. You know, it gives us something to break it up and then go back to something. That last time we were doing a freeze where we kept going back to something that we froze, you know. First, let's play the cue. Let's play the long cue. Okay, so here's the cue. Uh, one, two, three, ah. So that, that would be one. So, um. Let's try to plug it in? Yeah, we'll plug it in. We'll play eight bars and then play it, and then go back to tempo. Two, three, ah. So that, that was everything all thrown in at once, you know, condensed version of the tune. Really the reason for cues at all, and you know, the reason that there's a bunch of cues in this song and that we use them improvisationally in other songs, is just a kind of, it's like a reset button for us to have a cue. Because we're, it's all coming out of our heads, most of it, and, and we're going along on a path, and whether the music itself asks for some kind of dramatic change, or whether we feel like we've played everything we can play in that zone or whatever it is, by just calling a cue, it, it sort of ref it's a reset. It refreshes all of our imaginations so we can go off into some other direction or return to the same thing, which we did uh, on this last tune. But we've talked about some of the cues that we do, but really there's no, the cue could be anything. It could be uh, green. We could have a cue called green, and, and whatever we thought green meant. I would call green, and that would direct us in some other direction. It would give us that necessary kind of jumping off point to go someplace else. Um, so th that really evolved out of getting up on a stage and saying, you know, we're not going to really have a lot of written music here. What are we going to do? How do you improvise for two sets and keep yourselves and the audience interested? How do you keep people coming to see that? Who would want to see that? Um, 
Like, so we tried to come up with things that, that kind of optimized our chances of keeping it really fresh and creative all the time because cr creativity is never uninteresting. As long as it's creative, it's interesting. It's interesting to do and it's interesting to listen to. So these cues are just kind of ways to sort of poke ourselves with a stick and say, hey, wake up, you know, here, deal with this somehow. And it, it can really be anything you can imagine. I mean, I'd, we were kind of into, when the band was working a lot, we were into kind of coming up with new cues to give ourselves. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm sure everybody in this room could come up with 10. Do you have any today. dynamic cues? Huh? Do you have any dynamic cues? Well, we have a cue for quiet, which I did a couple of times, but it, it was at a point where it wasn't very dramatic. And that cue is just, shh. I just turn to Keith and go, shh. And that means at the beginning of the next eight, we're down. I thought about having a cue for loud, but with this band, it's really not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to go there. Yeah, it, it, always, it always is growing. You know, whatever it is that we're doing, we rarely stay at one dynamic. It's usually always expanding. So the, re the return to quiet is useful, definitely. A couple times I've seen you play your hands on the snare drum. And it looks like it's like a tabla technique. Have you ever studied tabla or any of the hand percussion? And can you demonstrate a little bit of that? Um, sure. I, I've never studied it. I've only heard it a lot, and I'm, I'm a fan of it. I don't know the vocabulary of tabla at all. <clears throat> but it, it is kind of, in a way, and I never said I want to emulate a tabla, but I guess that's kind of the, 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 the sound it has using the, the harmonics of the head. You know, and um, and it's you know how like how at least I did when I was in grade school I would play on the desk. This would, these two fingers would always be my rolls, and then these would be the accents. You know, so you're like you know. That's how I would practice my drum line. You know, in, in school. You know. So I just took that same technique, and I'm just playing. I'm just basically playing different rolls, five stroke rolls and accents, and I'm hitting a, a rim shot with the finger um, and using the muffling, you know, with my left hand uh, after the fact. So that's a, you know, that's just a five stroke roll. Just kind of, but putting it close together, you know. And it's just kind of an effect I, I've been working on or came up with somehow with this band probably because they, they use so many different sounds. So I had to find ways to, on an acoustic kit to, to get different sounds out of it that were different and interesting. And so, uh, you know, you, when, he, when Wayne says shh and I get quiet, that's kind of the stuff I start thinking of because I've been playing sticks all night. I want to do something really drastic. So, um, you know, you can play grooves like that, like one, two, three. Something like that. And then, you know, I, and then when I'm playing, sometimes I'll reach over and grab a stick to, to, to bring it up a notch, you know. So if I'm three, four. Of course, I can also grab another stick and use both rims and just come up with something on the spot. Do you ever use brushes or multi rods or? Yeah, I do actually. Like that? You know that that kind of stuff comes in handy for like doing 
studio sessions for more like to get you know different vibes it really records well if you, yeah. if you use you know brushes or plastics or anything like that for any like singer songwriter type gigs and you know how about with this band with this band i haven't you know it just haven't really heard it but um i think for more really low volume music it, it makes more sense there was a band i played with uh, for a while david johansson had a band called the harry smiths and so i played with my hands and brushes and plastics all night you know it was a very down home kind of low volume sitting on the porch kind of band it was really fun so it challenged me to come up with things like that and then i brought it into this band as well and, you know. i was wondering if you could talk about how you kind of view your role as a drummer in an instrumental ensemble and then also if uh, Tim and Wayne could also talk about how or what they want a drummer to do I guess like I guess how you view the drummer's role in an instrumental ensemble also I'm providing rhythm and um, and dictating a lot of of uh, how the grooves feel along with the other musicians in a group you know everybody works together on that on creating the groove but um, because I'm the drummer I'm I have the authority of it so I have to uh, I have to have a really confident sense of how I want that to sound and what what that is t to me and and have that authority and, and take control um, and then in an instrumental setting, I, I'm just trying to be creative and come up with new things on the spot. I feel like that's how I practice in a way, but it's in a musical um, scenario. I'm not in a practice room by myself. I'm playing with musicians that are challenging me and inspiring me to, to find something new every time I play. I'm not, it's not always successful, but that's the goal, you know. I think a really big part of what I would need to have in a drummer is the inspirational thing of of having from the drums stuff coming at me that inspires me to play and it's funny that's not something that automatically happens with good players sometimes there's there's just a connection thing that's not there in terms of the inspiration and in those cases then maybe I'll play more of just vocabulary that I have and I mean I'm not really a lick player at all anyway but I mean, there's probably a certain set of quasi-creative in the moment stuff that I do every time I play that I would probably rely on more if there wasn't someone kind of lighting a fire under it. And like I just noticed when we came here today and started playing immediately from both of these guys, I was getting that energy. Like I, I was thinking of things. I had no trouble thinking of what was coming next or anything like that. So that's kind of, that's an intangible, that's sort of a, you know, the magic part that we were talking about before. Um, technically, you know, there's a, to play this music, the drummer needs to be somebody that can keep track of phrases without getting lost, no matter how many superimpositions of other time signatures or over the bar phrasing or displacements happen, because that stuff happens all the time when we play. Every second, somebody is doing that. So, the drummer obviously, like the bass player, would need to be able to control that enough and hear it and not let it throw them. Um, and you know, there has to be kind of, not, not to, not so that there's never a mistake, but just so basically most of the time that's there. And, uh, and you know, obviously the music is groovy. So, I mean, you know, Carlock has all this stuff. So it's, I guess I'm just really talking about his playing, but no matter how interesting it is in terms of complexity, rhythmic complexity, it has to feel good. If it doesn't feel good, there's absolutely no reason to be doing it for me because I'm not into the math of it at all. I mean, we're, I think we're all just kind of, these, this is how we hear rhythm, you know? These are our state, these are our melodies coming out. Sometimes our melodies are in 5-8 against 4-4 four, four or, or whatever. Sometimes they resolve strangely, but that's really just the way we're hearing it. We're not thinking about it like, let me make sure this mathematical equation is being understood or something. It's, it's not that kind of vibe. So it has to feel good. It has to be kind of fun. And uh, so that, that would be another thing. And, and then, you know, there's just also, 
It has to be somebody you can get along with, you know, and somebody who likes it. That's important to have that. And, uh... Well, I want to thank Wayne Krantz and Tim Lefebvre for playing with me today and, and, uh, and you guys being here to, to uh, be interested and uh, make this happen. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. When I was uh, in school, university level at uh, North Texas, I studied with Ed Sof, who uh, taught the molar technique. And uh, it really changed the way that I played a lot because I came from a drumline background. And um, when you're in the drumline, you're, you're, you, everyone has to look the same in the line. And, and it's really more wrist stroke oriented. And, um, and a little more rigid, you know, because it's, it's, everything has to look very regimented and, and uh, all the strokes are the same and um, everything stays pretty low, you know. But when I studied with Ed and I was learning more of a jazz approach and, and jazz touch on the drums, uh, that wasn't working, you know. It wasn't, I wasn't able to get the right sound or the right feel. So he loosened me way up by teaching me this molar method. <clears throat> Since then, I think it's kind of morphed into my own version of it. You know, I don't think I do it exactly right, but the concept is the same. And that is that the stick naturally rebounds. And just to demonstrate, <clears throat> you know, when I, I, before I do, I always think of it as, a, as bouncing a ball. You know, you, you're letting the, the, you're pushing the ball down, it comes back by itself, and you're pushing it back down, you know. So, Back in the drumline days, I would play and stop here, whereas then you would have to lift it back up. <laughs> so now it comes back up by itself. So, so now, you know, I'm just bouncing, you know. And before I go any further, I've developed this open-handed technique where, where I'm just putting my hand out as if I'm shaking someone's hand pretty naturally, nothing contorted or, or strange about it, and just put the stick in, and that's basically, that's it. The thumb is on top now, and my fulcrum is here. So it's just kind of revolving around my thumb, basically. And then these, these three fingers are there to, to help out. So I use mostly finger strokes. And in um, the left hand, it's basically the same. You know, my hand's just kind of there at this angle, instead of this angle. Um, put it in and, and uh, use the fingers to manip manipulate the stick. I mostly use these two, and these are more just to kind of hold on and push back if I need to, whatever. But um, I'm holding it there, basically, as well, if I really want to open the hand. So they both have that option of really being open, and then the fingers can kind of play along as well. So, <clears throat> back to the stroke, um, I'm always thinking about the bounce. And there's, there's basically one level where that would kind of be my unaccented note, grace note level. And I'm just bouncing, I'm just basically twitching the fingers, pushing it back down, I'm just bouncing that up and down. I'm not lifting, with that would be more energy than needs to, to happen. You know, just let the stick naturally come back. And you see, I'm really not using the wrist much at all. It's just really fingers, you know. I'm just bouncing. I could probably sit here and do this for a while, you know, without getting too tired, you know. So I'm just bouncing it. But then, if I want to have a little more uh, power or an accent, I can use a little whipping motion like this. To, to get a little more out of it. So just putting a little more weight behind the stick. And it's still bouncing back up. It's the sensation of pulling the sound out instead of digging in and getting tense and tight. You know, it just helps me to stay loose. And that's the goal of this whole technique is to stay loose and relaxed and not work as hard. Let the stick do more of the work for you. So, so there's the other level.
And then, <clears throat> you know, if I need a lot more power, the, the more weight I put behind the stick, the more, you know, power I'm going to have. So I, I have the, the weight of the arm, you know. I'm exaggerating, but sometimes I actually can do this just to get the, the sound I want. But then nothing changes in the hands. I'm still bouncing. See? And this looks ridiculous, but, but that's, that's uh, just to show you nothing in the hands really changes. I'm always thinking about the bounce. So, just some rudimental exercises, type of stuff I warm up on before I show, just random stickings. Um, and it's, I apply that to the kit. At least I try to be conscious of it at all times. Um, the way that I play the cymbals, the way that I play the hi-hat, toms, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. That same feeling of letting the stick come back. Um, like so, just, just to show you. crashing like it doesn't quite bounce back but I have the same feeling of letting it go and just letting it do its thing you know um, if I'm on the hi-hat playing eighth notes the way that I you know instead of getting to where I'm lifting too much or, or getting tight you know just trying to keep it relaxed it's this, the exact same motion so just on the hi-hat you know just just whatever it is, I'm, I'm always thinking of this bounce happening. So three. You know, and if I want to get more power, then I can use the arm and it, you know, it, it stiffens up from time to time to get a certain sound. But overall, I want to always have this, this feeling of, of it coming back. You know, um, and then getting getting the grace notes happening, I use that momentum of of the accent or the backbeat to, you know, I can keep the stick bouncing because of that momentum, catching the bounce, and then just continue to bounce it with the fingers. So, like in a groove situation, I'll just add. I'll, I'll add a couple each time. So if it's like... As an exercise, I guess, but just to show you, I have all those options, and it's it's coming from that accent, that momentum. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I notice you're really far back on the left hand stick. You're like at the very end. Is that a feel thing for you? Just because it gives you more weight? Exactly. I think so. I think it's it's. I've kind of learned. You know, I, I guess when you when you're more in the um, you know this zone of the stick, the balance point, I guess. Um, you know, you can get a nice bounce, but I've just learned how to get a bounce back here that feels good to me. And um, it's just to get a better wind up for a bigger backbeat because I'm using more of the stick, you know. And um, 
Yeah, it's just a feel thing. Just kind of works. And, you know, all this stuff, it's important for me to say, is this is just what I've come up with for myself. Whenever I show people this, this hand technique, I'm not saying you have to play this way, you know, because, you know, we all have our, we can make our own decisions on what works for us. But, you know, if you are feeling tense and tight, I'd recommend at least trying it. Give, give it a shot or at least take something from it. You know, whatever you can do to just, just to kind of relax your hands more, or whatever it takes. Because we don't, we don't want to work too hard. We want to use, you know, we want to be able to, to execute whatever we hear and not be hindered by our technique, you know. It should be for music. And, um, and that, you know, my setup is very, everything's really close. Um, I don't, like, you know, I don't want to work too hard to get to something. So everything's just right here and, and comfortable for me, you know. I think that's what's important, is just finding what works for you. And, and this is what I've come up with so far. Can you explain your approach to foot technique? Yeah, um, I basically play on the bass drum pedal. I play heel up, and I kind of pivot my foot in the, in the middle of the footboard. I seem to get a nice balance there. And um, I'm sure I move around on the footboard depending on what I'm playing, but I think generally it's, it's here. And, um, and when the kick drum is, is uh, tuned like this, I'm definitely pulling, not pulling off, but letting it bounce back, just like I do the hands, you know, I kind of feel it the same way. So the, the beater's hitting the head and coming back always. And then I can rest my leg, you know, put my heel down at that point, if there's time, depending on what, you're pl what I'm playing, um, to relax. And um, so, you know, basically looks like this. You know, my heel is up and uh, I'm just kind of pivoting my, my ankle and using the leg for, for uh, added weight and power if I need it. If I were to dig into the head with it tuned this way, I'd get a little flutter sound. Because um, it's kind of flamming, you know, because the air is inside the drum moving around. Um, so that's another reason I, I need to come off of it. When I play an, a, a kick drum that is muffled, um, I have the option. Sometimes I dig in just for feel, you know, or just if I'm really hitting hard. It just, sometimes that does feel good. You just lay into it. Um, but when you're coming off the head, you're going to get a different sound. It's, it's going to resonate more and you're going to get more vibration. So I think for the most part, I'm always thinking about coming off, you know, um, and just letting it resonate and do its thing. The left foot on the hi-hat is, uh, I guess, pretty similar. I'm always heel up and, uh, you know, I do a lot of, um, splashes where you you kind of kick the pedal if I'm riding and I want to have like an open hi-hat effect um, do a lot of that in, in certain phrases and you can let them kind of ring together if you want it to last longer But that's, you know, basically all I have to say at this point about it. It's, but it's just, also, I really want to stay relaxed down there and not get tired and tense. That's a conscious effort. Do you ever get into double bass drumming? I actually used to play double, double pedal. And when I first started playing, I actually did have two bass drums. Um, it just got to where the music that I was getting called to play and the, and the gigs that I've done just really... Was it necessary? Except for the ends of songs where you do the bugga dugga dugga <laughs> maybe or something. But I just didn't want to do that and, and I just didn't hear it. I just um it just wasn't quite working for what I was getting called to do. And it forced me to to uh try to do different things with the hi hat, you know, with uh, with the foot. And um you know, using it as another voice instead of just uh for eighth note grooves. You know, I use it 
obviously, as you've seen that I've been playing uh, today, just kind of using it as another voice on the kit that's, that's not always constant. It can, it can be whatever you want it to be, really. You know? Mm -hmm. Could you demonstrate some of those heel splashes and maybe some multiple strokes on your bass drum inside of a groove? Multiple strokes, sure. Yeah, I like we're doing like maybe three strokes or th two strokes. So yeah. Just one. I mean, everybody knows how to do the one stroke. Something like two, three, uh. It's fun to, you know, use this as a, as you would poss possibly, uh, you know, instead of a bass drum, I'm just playing a hi-hat with the foot and a lot of interesting things just happen automatically. Yeah. Could you demonstrate some of the stuff you do before you go on stage? Um, That's like a warm-up routine or anything? I'll get the pad for that. Uh, you know, I'll do just different... Uh, hand combinations, you know, whether it's just fours on each hand. Add a flam at the top of the one, you know. Maybe do threes. Add a flam. That kind of stuff. And then, uh, of course, I'll start slowly and <laughs> work up to that. Um, and just different combinations like... Um, just to kind of let this, this bounce happen, get that kind of nice and... Chloe. And then and then I'll just place different things uh, that I remember from the drumline days, you know, just whatever comes to mind. Uh, know just whatever I can do to just work each side evenly and just get both sides feeling nice and warm. Was there anything that you worked on to kind of heighten your mental concentration for just to kind of be able to make it through these long and intense gigs you know? Just like anything just from doing it for many years and and almost every day of my life it's just kind of how I'm programmed and um, obviously getting good rest and eating well is going to help, you know, uh, but just, that's just kind of all I've ever done. So I, that's just what I know. And, um, it's year after year, I see, I seem to get, you know, a little, it gets easier the more you do it, I think. Yeah. Keith, you use a lot of odd phrasing in your playing. I was wondering if there's anything you worked on to develop that. Um, I don't think there's anything, uh, other than, you know, listening to players that do that, that influence me. Um, listen to people like Tony Williams or, or Elvin or, um, you know, any, a lot of jazz drummers play over the bar line, you know, and, and um, but those two really, really hit, hit home with me, just not trying to play like them, but just the spirit of it, the listening to those records and, and just hearing the phrases that they played by just listening to it over and over and over, and then it just became, oh, I could kind of hear what, more what was happening. And um, A way that I used to practice um, 
because I I do it more in in a rock funk you know uh, R and B way maybe using sixteenth notes instead of triplets and a swing feel you know but it's the same concept really um, so one way I used to practice it was just playing along to um, records that were in eight bar phrases because um, you, you get to where you hear those phrases really naturally you know like a verse of a song is usually going to be eight bars so I would just play along to to um, sequence records that were as I was growing up that were popular and as an exercise I would just play along I wouldn't play the song I would I would improvise over what I was hearing so I was one thing it was doing was I was working on creativity responding to the vocals or responding to the bass line or whatever was going on or playing in the middle of it in the gaps you know answering the vocal line things like that but always knowing where those phrases are and then it's also you're working on your time because it's nowadays we really do have to be able to play with a click you know because it's it's done so much in recording these days so you know it was helping me with with that also um, and really playing with Wayne Krantz's group and other groups that I've played with that allow me that freedom that's really where it, it happened you know just doing it week after week and just working on it you know and um, I mean I could play a really basic phrase where I'll play eight bars and then the next eight bars I'll, I'll play a fill into the f into the next eight bars but I won't stop a at one um, you know I'll, I'll go to um, uh, well, let's see I'll go to three of the first bar of the next phrase um, th just simple things like that is a good way to start to, and then to also know where you are that that's really not one that's a three of the next you know the next phrase so I guess that that would be something that you could start with something like that um, so if we're here one two three four See, I'm counting it <laughs> to show that I know where I am and, and uh, I'm just improvising around it. And that's what I used to do. I'd be listening to uh, whatever, uh, the Thriller record or something, and uh, playing around Michael's vocals. It's just not that you would play it that way, you know, obviously, but it was just an exercise and it, it was more of a musical way to do it instead of just having a click pounding in your ear, you know. And, um, most pop music is eight bar phrases, so it just covered everything. So it's just a suggestion, but um, mostly just listening to players that do that and it inspires you to figure out what they're doing, transcribing or whatever it takes. Well, I just wanna thank you guys for being here and uh, making this happen. Uh, really appreciate it and uh, your interest and your questions and uh, really made it uh, a lot of fun. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.